What is going on you guys, Admiral Tori here, and welcome on board for another World of Warship video on my channel. So today I'm going to be selling the Tier 8 Premium German Battleship Tirpitz. So the Tirpitz is the sister ship to the Bismarck, and this is one of the biggest reasons why the Tirpitz is very popular on World of Warships for being a premium ship. She cost about 60 some dollars when I purchased her during the launch day of World of Warship that came with the Tirpitz. Now Wargaming forced you had to to buy the bundle rather than just the ship so I had to pay a pretty hefty price for her but to me it was every penny to be buying the ship because it was a ship that I really wanted and you don't get the opportunity to actually play a Bismarck class battleship until the German line has been released. So the Tirpitz, let's talk about the history of the Tirpitz. Now she is part of the Bismarck class battleship, like I said, she was the sister ship to the Bismarck. There were only two ships, the Bismarck herself and the Tirpitz as I speak. The Tirpitz and the Bismarck were the were pretty much a potential enemy to the Royal Navy during World War II. And this was very big for Germany, very very big. I can't stress how big this was, but it changed the warfare of the Atlantic big time. Although the Bismarck and Turpix didn't really see that, you know, heavily action compared to World War I, in the first war there was more emphasis on battleships cruisers, and it was a thing that nations tried to develop futuristic battleship as fast as possible. The nation with the best battleship has been proven to be a powerful nation because battleships were the symbol of the country. So the Royal Navy has always been top of their game at all times. I can't recall any other country that even come near the Royal Navy when it comes to battleships until World War II happened. So what I mean by the Royal Navy being the top of the line is that they has always been the dominant nation when it comes to naval. They stress a lot of naval technology, they introduced the HMS Dreadnought which was a revolutionary design for the battleship line. Uh, if it weren't for HMS Dreadnought then it, you know battleships wouldn't be as powerful today as it seems. Maybe not because you know maybe someone else discovered another design but the HMS Dreadnought has emphasized the all big gun idea and having big armor with good speed and this will introduce the new line of category of ships named the battle cruisers and the Germans and British has been always into battle cruisers and that was a huge thing because if you have a huge ship and it's slow then it won't do any good since it's gonna get pounded really easily easy target if it's going too slow or won't get to your destination in time if you can develop a ship with big guns not too slow but better armor than a cruiser then you can achieve such naval superiority over the seas against the cruisers and even battleships themselves so the british and germans always been at the race and it was not until the bismarck class battleship came out and this was very big like i said the reason why was that Britain has always been creating these powerful battleships and I really do believe British had one of the best ships in the world until the Bismarck class battleship has really stopped in the path. And you can tell by this because Winston Churchill who was the Prime Minister of Britain during the war he saw that these two ships must be sunk right away and he sent the King George V class battleships I think, HMS Hood, a lot of cruisers, torpedo bombers just to sink the Bismarck and the Bismarck proven the power because she was pounded to death to a point where there was no operational mechanics on top of the deck meaning that all the turrets were blown, A were destroyed, no life on the deck. That was, that was, that's how powerful the British wanted to pound the ship and yet she was still sailing in the water. It was not until she was struck by more torpedoes, more hits and the crew themselves on the Bismarck, they actually scuttled the ship to a point where the ship internal was destroyed because they didn't want to let the enemy have the ship although the main objective of the Royal Navy at that time was to sink the ship not to preserve the ship. So after what happened to the Bismarck the Tirpitz wasn't really seen in action she didn't really fire her main armament that much throughout the war until 1944 when she was sunk by the Lancaster using the Tallboy bomb which was designed specifically designed to go through the hard armor of the deck of the Bismarck and sink her. So the oh more specifically the Tirpitz not the Bismarck but the Bismarck class in general they are really sister ship there's the similar the big difference between the Bismarck and the Tirpitz is that the Tirpitz was equipped with torpedoes and she is slightly heavier than the Bismarck so technically she is much larger than the Bismarck. 
But then again, the Tirpitz was able to survive longer than the Bismarck, so they've done a lot of modification to the ship. So overall, the ship history isn't that, you know, extremely legendary, like the war spite sailing around the world battling ships and doing a lot of warfare. She is more of a intercepting convoy, but also a huge symbol to Germany's navy because, like I said, the Royal Navy has been the dominant navy in the world. They're the one who running the biggest empire in history. They had to go, you know, travel to India, travel to China. They got to travel to parts of, I think, maybe some parts in the Falkland Islands. They colonized a lot of places, and in order to keep the place going, the only way they can connect around the world is through naval. Now, aviation is arguably one of the ways, but aviation is not a big thing yet during that time, because I think Charles Lindbergh was the first man to sail across the Atlantic. It took him a while, you know. It, it, it really takes a lot of ability, you know, a lot of determination to sail against the Atlantic for that long. He only ate like a couple of food, and that tells you how long it takes aviation to get across sea. Now that was not until, you know, the Boeing 747 comes out and all these big jumbo jets. So naval was very key and aviation was still primitive. So they still put more emphasis on battleship. Not until World War II when the change of warfare tactics has changed the position of battleships. Battleships started to become less important and more into aviation, submarine warfare, and cheaper ships like better cruisers with torpedo armaments or good escort cruiser to escort carriers. So I can't really talk too much about the Tirpitz in terms of her history service, but there is one very special thing about the Germans and the British when it comes to ships, and they tend to name their ships off of famous people. So who is Tirpitz? Now I'm assuming that not many people really you know, take the opportunity to look up the name Tirpitz. They only assume it's just say, you know, the name of the ship, they look up the name of the ship, the history of the ship. So since I can't really talk much about the history of the Tirpitz other than intercepting trading convoys and preventing the Soviets and British getting supply from the United States, I can tell you about the man named Alfred von Tirpitz. Now these ships were named after Otto von Bismarck and Alfred von Tirpitz. These two figure men, these men, were very influential heroes of Germany. Otto von Bismarck was the man who unified Germany. Germany wasn't really a country before the 1900s. They were split up into the Prussian Empire, um, some Austrian, some Polish. It was really, Germany history goes all the way back to Germania, which is the Roman times. And over the course of years, centuries, due to political, um, family ruling, and all those duchies, and I don't know, the, the, the line, okay? The, the line of kings, it's really complicated history. So, what Audubon Bismarck did was that he unified Germany through his negotiation skills. And he was a very important German hero. If it weren't for him, then Germany wouldn't really be one country. It's the same way as the United States split up into two sides, the North and the South during the Civil War. Uh, the South wanted slavery, the North doesn't agree with that. So it was really two countries, the United States of America under the Union, and there was the Confederate States of America. Until Abraham Lincoln, who is like equivalent to Bismarck, unify both sides. Now there's not just Abraham Lincoln, there's other people, but similar to the idea. So what did Tirpitz do? Well, after Germany was unified, realizing the power of naval that is very important to display the country's power, I mean, who doesn't want their country to be one of the most powerful countries in the world? Alfred von Tirpitz understood that Germany needs to be on the grid in terms of being one of the most powerful Western power. And Germany did end up being one of the most powerful countries in the world in the 1900s considering their naval um, technology advances, physics, education, their economy, people, landmass, uh, production. And they're one of the most, actually this is the most industrialized country in the world in the 1900s before, before the end of World War II. After the end of World War II, obviously Berlin was, you know, destroyed to bits and pieces. Soviet Union took half of Germany or some other stuff. Really complicated, but back to the dot. Alfred von Tirpitz, what he did was that he went to Navy school. He served on the Navy for the German. Um, he went around the world. He served on several boats, I believe. But I don't know the specific information what boat he sailed. But I know for a fact that he is a veteran. A big veteran when it comes to naval. And what he thought was that Germany, if, if, order, if in, in order for Germany to be better than the French, Russians, the British, and the Americans, 
He said that we need a better naval, and he's the one who actually advocate the fleet act, which means that Germany will set a expectation to build these amount of battleships, these amount of cruisers, and these amount of destroyers and other other ships. You know, um, if it weren't for him, Germany would have a very small naval, and if Germany had a small naval, World War II wouldn't be even possible for Germany to win because Britain would just completely blockade the sea compared to you know their their only dominance is land. Okay, but if Alfred, you know Alfred von Tirpitz was there, he was the biggest reason why Britain was severely siege under siege, meaning that no supplies were going out of the island or into the island to the point that Britain almost surrendered. You know, I wouldn't say almost surrender. The word surrender, a lot of British would argue that they didn't really give up, but. Judging from the fact that Britain needed food supply to come into the country, they needed military arms, they were really running out of resources since they're an island compared to Germany who owns the entire landmass and taking over France, giving them extra, you know, extra material, extra workers. They're really on the losing end of the war. So naval has been proven very key and Alfred von Tirpitz has been a very important German figure when it comes to naval. He was the most influential man in navy in terms of building a big navy to contest the British. Now, the British still had more battleships than the Germans, so there was another thing that Alfred von Tirpitz wanted to do with the German navy, and the Germans were very famous up in the Atlantic, and that was the U-boat warfare. Now, submarines at that time were considered something restricted. You know, it wasn't necessarily uh, fair to use the submarine. I mean, the word fair and war does not go together that well. When it comes to war, there is no rules, to be honest, but we have established, you know, today we have established rules saying that no nuclear warfare, no biological weapons, and there's, you know, other stuff that war criminals would do. But submarine warfare at that time was still primitive, and they saw that submarine warfare was unfair and should be restricted if I were to describe it correctly. And knowing that the British had better a better fleet than the Germans at that time, before the Bismarck, Alfred von Tirpitz wanted submarine for warfare because if you can build five submarines that are stealthy, they can undergo stealth operation and sink five to ten battleships, then you're talking about a better end of the deal because if you can set just submarines in there while getting damaged because nobody can spot the submarine until sonar came in or radar, whatever you want to call it. But these submarines were able to sink battleships no problem. As long as they land their torpedo hits. And that was very big because, you know, battleships are expensive to run. You need to build the ship, which requires a lot of armor, um, technology for the fire control system, and then you have to train the men to learn how to use the main armaments, AA, secondaries, and to control the boiler room and pretty much man the ship. So he's the one who advocated submarine warfare, wanted Germany to build a bigger navy in order to contest all the western nation, and if it weren't for him, then Germany navy wouldn't compare to the French nor the Russians. And after they built the navy, they were able to contest the British. And like I said, the British were one of the most powerful navies in the world, if not the most powerful up into World War II. So overall, Mr. Tirpitz has done a lot to Germany. So let's talk about the water warship aspects of the Tirpitz. Now the Tirpitz does run 15 inch guns and a lot of people would complain about the 15 inch guns. To me, I think they're brilliant, honestly, because there is a huge advantage of using 15 inch guns. Now arguably, the 16 inch guns on the Amagi and the North Carolina do more damage than the Tirpitz 15 inch guns, but the difference in terms of damage is about 1000 to 2000 maximum damage difference. And to see that if you, if you land all your shots, which is really rare, um, it will make the maximum difference of 10,000 damage. But overall, there's a drawback with having 16-inch guns that the Tirpitz actually do better against the Amagi and the North Carolina. Is that she is much more accurate than the North Carolina. I'm not sure about the Amagi. I think the Amagi is slightly more accurate than the Tirpitz. But there's also something that the Tirpitz has better than the, Ama the Amagi that is a trade-off. But back to the armaments. These 
15 inch guns are much lighter than 16 inch guns, meaning that they can actually traverse the turret much faster. So you can adapt to both the starboard and port side of your ship right away. So if there is a ship on your right side, you can switch to the right side. If it's on the left side, you can switch to the left side. And this is very useful. It's almost like you're playing a cruiser with big guns. Now, having 15 inch shells mean that you can actually reload the shells faster than the 60 inch guns. So she shoots slightly much faster than the 60 inch guns on the Amagi and the North Carolina. So that gives it a slight advantage. So what you are trading is damage for fire rate and faster traverse speed because half the time on the Amagi and North Carolina is that you're still traversing your turret and aiming at your target. And a lot of the time, the target, by the time you aim it, that target probably disappeared or goes behind a landmass, whatever it is. But honestly, I think this allows you to have more versatility with these bigger guns, or not really bigger guns, but these smaller guns. The bigger guns on the North Carolina and the Magi, it's all about the damage. But if you can't hit anything or you can't train your targets with your turrets, then it's really no point of using them. But it's not you know, a huge difference. You can actually work around the Amagi and the North Carolina. So the armor, the, the Turpet's armor is actually the best of the three tier eight ship. It's much better than North Carolina and the Amagi especially because the Amagi is a battle cruiser. She has light armor. The North Carolina has light armor on the side, but very tough deck armor. So when you're going against the North Carolina and your shield just landing on the deck, what happens is that the immunity zone kicks in on the North Carolina, which is why a lot of North Carolina players tend to point their bow then rather their broadside. When you point your broadside with the North Carolina, you can instantly citadel the North Carolina, even with the 15-inch guns. I can citadel a Montana with these 15-inch guns, and I don't recall citadeling a Yamato yet because there hasn't been that much Yamato I went against with the Turpets. But the Turpets is designed for close quarter combat. If you want to utilize these 15 inch guns, you're gonna to have to get close and you know close and personal. If you try to engage at long distance with the 15 inch guns, it tends to bounce off the deck and you know deeming it really useless. The armor, like I said, she is the most heavily armored tier 8 ship. And it's really tough to citadel the Turpets unless you go broadside majority of the time. But just because you can't citadel a ship doesn't mean that she is not, you know, not easy to kill. She, you, you still do a lot of damage against the Turpets, considering that she is a, a long linear ship. Meaning that if you can land a lot of shots on the Turpets, it pretty much is equivalent to being citadel. I mean, if you land 10,000 damage on a ship, that's really a citadel to me in my own books. But as long as you angle the ship, the ship is extremely powerful against those 16 inch guns. Because her armor is just superb. Her AA is what is the weakest side on the Turpets. I rarely shoot down any tier 8, tier 7, tier 10, tier 9 aircraft carrier planes. It's really tough. So if you're wide open in the sea and you're going against an SX class carrier, which I happen to do sometimes, um, he can instantly one shot you with his torpedo bomber, whether you're full health or half health, whatever reason it is, you can easily die to the aircraft carriers if you're not very careful to stick with your team. Um, her speed is top notch. She goes 30 knots for her armor. So you don't really see that. Usually when you see a battleship, you either trade armor for speed or speed for armor, you know? But the Terpitz has both, and that what makes her extremely powerful. Her secondaries, I feel like they're slightly better than the Magis. Japanese secondaries tend to be better than majority of the battleships, but in this case, I really do like the German secondaries. Not sure, they're really on the same level as Magi, slightly better, slightly worse at times, but if it, do, if it destroy gets near you, then you can also use your main armament. Like I said, her, her main armament traverse speed is much faster than the Amagis and the North Carolina. So that's that's all good. Aside from that, let's try to get in the game and see how well does the Tirpitz perform in match. Alrighty you guys, we are finally in the match. Now, we are playing on a map called Trap. This is a domination game. It's not my particular favorite map when it comes to the spawn. It's actually a really good map in my opinion. It's wide open and there's plenty of cover at the same time, but the spawn is a little shaky because the team sometimes spawn on the... L well actually not sometimes, but majority of people spawn on the lower end of the map and the other team will spawn right here where I'm circling with my cursor. And the problem is that sometimes people go C, sometimes people don't go C. But I'm gonna go C because she is a fast ship so I can definitely get there in time. It's not a good idea to stack your entire fleet on A, 
since this is a domination game. If this was like a two flag game, then yeah, you can stack your people at A and have some people defend the flag. But ideally, you want to capture as much flags as you can in this match, especially domination, since this is a flag supremacy match. Whoever got the most flag will eventually win, unless your team has fallen apart too fast. So I'm expecting there's going to be at least one destroyer at C. Now there's already one destroyer on A, so I can't face two, three destroyers at once. I can only face two. And it looks like we spotted a Cleveland out in the distance. Now honestly, I would have went A, but it's not going to be a good idea when it comes to trying to win this game. So we're going to fire our Savile. One thing about Terpitz is that she is fun to just keep firing. She's just a ship that you just keep firing and don't stop firing. As long as you can spot somebody like that Cleveland. Got a lucky Citadel. Oh look, a North Carolina has decided to come this way. So I'm not alone. Right over the Terpits. And it just happens to be such horrible luck that there's two battleships. Okay, this is not good. I got plans. Okay, so this is going to be really tough for me to pull this one off. Our destroyer is going to leave me, so... I'm just going to fire at this York. Cut the speed. Good hits. Good hits. Now I'm going to turn around. There's no point for me going C. We're going to take A. And the destroyer is rushing up to me. So let's get out of here. I have no chance against the North Carolina and the Nagato at once. So hopefully I don't get broadsided. Yep, I'm going to get broadsided, probably. Oh yeah, Nagato is firing at me. Or that Cleveland also. Ooh, that was going to be painful. Felt the fire. Let's call our team for help. Uh, I'm pointing my stern, so this is a really good angle for me. Cleveland's gonna play a little smart by pointing his armor at me. But I am a veteran battleship player, so I kind of figure out how to angle these shots. Maybe I can shoot down a torpedo. He might run into one of them. That'd be cool. The torpedoes are 6km range, but the enemy is approaching me. Well, my torpedo tube got destroyed, so that's good timing to drop my torpedoes. There we go, we took out the Cleveland. But I'm on fire big time. Gotta get around this island as quick as possible. Because it's not going to do me any good if I get focused by these battleships. Come on, repair is coming up and not repair the damage control. So I'm on fire big time. Normally I hit the damage control at two fires, but I did it quickly because I think something got knocked out and I was getting focused by two battleships in Cleveland, so I wanted to take every time and every moment to repair or damage control. North Carolina North Carolina has fire another salvo on me. Okay, I'm out of concealment range. Put out the fire right away. I'm not gonna fire yet. There's no point. 15 inch guns won't penetrate that North Carolina deck armor. But, the bigger reason is that I don't want to get spotted anymore. So I'm gonna turn around. Our team is coming to support. And what kind of ship is that? There's a battleship. New Mexico. As long as I'm not spotted until that past the island and the Nagato will see me. Our victory is in sight. Oh look, we got victory. Victory in sight. So since they send two battleships on the side, that's probably why we got victory on the side. We we're able to capture A. C is just a far distance to capture. Nagato seems to be reversing or stopped. Incoming shells from the North Carolina's angle that armor. Got some good hits. Good hits. Incapacitation. 
Probably knock down one of his turrets. Now, Narc and I won't do any good at that distance. Since she's gonna be bouncing. Bouncing those shells. On my deck. But let's try to take out the Nagato as fast as possible. Just gonna keep firing at him. I do have a high fire rate on the ship. So we might as well put that to use. If it was like a low fire rate ship, then I will wait for the broadside. To be honest with you guys, I don't have a chance to get this at North Carolina if I try to duke it out. So I'm going to try to cut the distance, cut the fighting distance, and make him get in my torpedo range on the right side, since my left side has been knocked out pretty hard. New Mexico, coming in to assist. Now, I know for a fact that North Carolina won't go for the ram on me, because I'm low health, he's still high health. Or full health almost. Let's try to get this Nagato out of the game. Oh. Was that his main armament or was his secondaries? His secondaries. Nagato has really nice secondaries. Oh, please. Please, New Mexico, don't ram. Don't ram. Please don't ram me. Okay, I gotta wait for that broadside. Gotta wait for it, gotta wait for it, gotta wait for it. Fire now, he's gonna fire at me. Nice, nice. Get the turret traversing. We're gonna go left. Hard left. North Carolina is showing a broadside. This is my chance to try to sit out the ship. We gotta keep going fast here. So the right, the left side is pretty beat up, but the right side is not. Under the turret for the magazine. Got one hit. Got another hit. Drop the torpedoes. Making run into those torpedoes. Ooh, repair. It's gonna take four torpedoes. Oh, no, three. Now, the North Carolina has slow traversing turrets, and he only has his rear turret pointing at me. So this is my opportunity to keep charging, as long as somebody stops shooting at me, like at a Tago. Oh my gosh, bounce that shot, yes. Beautiful. We're going in hard. Oh, he's gonna show a broadside. When is my torpedo? 48 seconds. Got good hits. Well, six hits, but they mostly bounce. Keeping that Narcala running. Narcala knows that I have torpedoes, okay? He doesn't want a broadside. He's afraid. I'm slightly faster than the Narcala is on going in a straight line. Bounce. Good armor. Maybe we can incapacitate his rear turret. Do some decent amount of damage. Ooh, he's set on fire like crazy. He's gonna die to fire. Secondaries are just beautiful on the Tirpitz. She is simply a beautiful ship. Her name is actually, the nickname for the Tirpitz is the Lonely Queen, I believe. Because she was the last Bismarck class. Well, there were only two, arguably, but she was lonely majority of the war, like I said. They don't want to die too early. Don't want to lose the Tirpitz too early. She's a very key ship to be playing. Now we need to go back and grab C. Now the Otago has... Is that Otago alive? It disappeared on me. Was that Otago or a destroyer? I don't know. I saw someone here. Disappeared. I'm still spotted, so... Fire at me. Someone's firing at me. It was Otago. Not sure that's enough. Oh, we gotta switch back to um, AP. What's not firing HE this entire time? Oh, it wouldn't matter because the, the what do call him? The North Carolina was pointing his stern. Now I gotta be very careful with the Otago. Otago can drop his torpedo and. My gosh, there is a Russian destroyer here. I knew something was fishy. Let's cut the speed. He's probably dropped his torpedoes. Oh yeah, I'm probably dead here. 
dead man. Now I'm hoping for that Russian destroyer to peek, peek me. If I can steal this Otago, I'll be saved. He is firing it. HE. Two fires set. The ship is on fire. Secondary is going off. Please, secondaries, kill him. Oh, come on, secondaries, you can do it. You can do it. Solved, sir. There we go. Enemy destroyer blown up. Uh, there could be torpedoes, so I'm going to play it safe and go this way. Ooh. On fire again. Looks like the torpedoes are not coming, so probably because it's a Russian destroyer. Oh, nope, I lied. They're coming, they're coming. Let's go left, go left, go left. I'm so dead, I'm so dead, I'm so dead. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna take one. Oh my gosh, I knew it. Oh, that was crazy. I need a breather. Let's see the after action report. Alrighty, you guys, I was able to crank out a whopping 559,000 coins, which is a lot. It's gonna help me to buy more stuff for this ship and other ships that I'm gonna need in my docks. And I was able to achieve the high caliber award. So I landed 59 hits with the main armament, 3 torpedo hits with the 4 torpedoes I launched, 2 incapacitation, 4 destroyed, 4 sound on fire, 3 cost flooding, 2 citadels, and 12 for defending the flag. Now this placed me on the top of the leaderboard with 2,720 base XP. The amount of damage I did was 103,000 with AP, which is what you expect from a battleship. 9,000 for HE, 8,000 for setting things on fire, 897 for cause flooding. So the North Carolina absolutely hit that damage control right away. Now we got 29,000 damage with torpedoes. So in my opinion, the Tirpitz is the best battleship in her class when it comes to close quarter engagement. She was designed to be close quarters because she doesn't have the big armament to do long range slugging and she has torpedoes. So I think if you know how to use the Tirpitz, you would definitely win any close quarter battle against another battleship in her class. Even up to tier 10, I have faced the Montana and Yamato and they're a little worried about my torpedoes. So keep that note in mind. Now the secondaries were able to do 3,440 damage, mainly on the North Carolina, I believe when I was chasing him with my torpedoes, and one to finish off the Russian destroyer who eventually killed me. Overall, it was a good game, and let's go for one more round with the Tirpitz. Alrighty, you guys, we have finally found another match with the Tirpitz. So we're playing on a map called Land of Fire. It's just two flags that we gotta capture, and we're going against the two Amagis, a Fuso, and the Tirpitz herself with the Lexington that could potentially sink us at the same time. There are four destroyers, there are three cruisers that I'm not really that big of a concern unless they're focusing me the entire time to set me on fire. For whatever reasons, our biggest concern is trying to sink the Amagi and the Tirpitz. So let's see, how am I going to approach this? Now this map is laid out kind of weird. I wouldn't say necessarily weird, but it pits you in the corner. So. Destroyers tend to go on the east side where all these small islands are. You see the little small islands with my cursor. And the battleships and all the other ships tend to go this way. With some cruisers, they might go in the east. But it kind of forces you to go this side. So it, it's weird, but it's kind of good. So they force the battleship players to go one side rather than some games or some maps like Two Brothers. I think that's the name of the map or big brothers one of those two but two brothers basically splits the team in half and sometimes battleships go all one side and they end up fighting just destroyers whatever it is but this has a more clear objective when it comes to fighting another ship now i also put on the german camel for the ship it's actually a very beautiful camel it's one of my most favorite camels in this game if not the most favorite as i speak so hopefully we are facing battleships sometimes battleships go the other other way like these two battleship that's kind of odd I wonder, I wonder why they're going that way. What, what battleships are they? Magi and North Carolina. Now, the battleships should go this side. Like, these. Any battleship got the right idea. So, this is gonna put me at a disadvantage, kind of. Oh, I have the Tirpitz with me, so it's not that bad. But the battleships should have went this side. Now, don't get me wrong, there could be destroyers on that side also. 
destroyers tend to go this side because they know for a fact that a lot of battleships come this way. It's always good to have good map knowledge of games. And eventually everyone will figure out the map. You know, if you play enough of these ships and you play the same map, then you know how the map goes. Sometimes you want to pull up the most odd move on the enemy team. They expect you to be a destroyer, but you pull off a battleship out of nowhere. So, let's try to get in range against those battleships. Now, Magi is stock. You can tell by having no Pagoda Mass. And they have a Cleveland. Now, this is our chance. Oh, okay. There are... That those are destroyers torpedoes, so that's not good. Fubuki decides to go this side. I don't think that's a Fubuki torpedo. He can't drop a torpedo that far. Ah. Oh. oh, this is not good. This is really weird. How can there's no destroyers on this side? They decided to pull off the weird card. So our best chance is to duke it out range, which is not good for the torpedo. She's better off at close quarters combat. Hey, let's see if we can hit these. Let's see who should we hit. Terpits? Amagi showing better broadside. She's not going all the way fast, but let's just give it enough lead. Test shot. By the time the shells get over there, my shell should be almost loaded. Okay. That's about correct speed, just a little too ahead. She's slowing down, kind of, so. Maybe less lead. Mm, coming out of angle. Sam's is turpits. Oh, they're all coming out at a really rough angle. Just looking at the mini map, you can tell these ships are going at an angle. Let's fire that salvo. That'd be nice if I get a citadel. Oh, speaking of the devil. We actually got a citadel on the turpits with 15 inch guns. That tells you that these guns is capable of citadeling any ships. Except the Yamato. I have not Citadel Yamato with the Turpets yet. Probably because I haven't faced that much Yamatos, and Yamatos tend to not come close quarters. That means I will Citadel this Amagi if he chooses to go broadside. It's probably the last salvo. Not ram into this island. Oh yeah, good damage. Oh, good dodge, good dodge. Let's rotate to the left. Try to go left here. Ooh, good dodge by me. Let's cut the speed to around half. Turpitz is a little pissed off at me for hitting him that hard. Oh, 7,000 damage, not bad. Uh, hopefully I can turn fast enough before they shoot me in the broadside. Yeah, Magi is not pointing his guns, that's all that matters. If Magi points his 16 inch guns, I'll definitely get the pain. Let's fire at the Turpid skin. Oh, this is gonna bounce, please bounce. Yeah! Minimal damage, 3000 damage on him. Always remember, movement is very key on World of Warships. Sometimes it's not all about the guns, it's about the positioning. I'm more of a strategist rather than, you know, Always shooting, shooting. You gotta think of both sides. You can't always think one-sided. A lot of people tend to think one-sided. It won't do them any good. Okay, Magi is shooting at us. Barely did any damage, which is nice. And I barely did any damage on him, too. Oh, he's showing his sprouts. He's gonna fire his other cannons here. Oh, that's gonna hit. Oh, that hurt. A little bit. Not that much damage. Good armor. So we can sit out this this uh, Magi. That should be sit out, is it? No. Now where did the destroyers go? Oh god, I'm gonna ram into our own Magi. Okay. Good, good. I'm gonna try to kill the Magi as fast as I can here. Even though I'm showing broadside to that turf bits. That should do. Well, turf is not doing a good job at aiming at me. Looks like Aramagi will finish him off. I'll let him do that. Is he gonna finish him off? 
I don't mind finishing him off for you. Oh yeah, you got him. Our flag is getting captured by the destroyer. Gotta go back. I'm not a fan of going back and trying to kill a destroyer. Oh, why do we have all those little ships on the side? One hit. 2,000 damage. That's pretty good. Hit. I gotta go back for our decap. Oh my gosh, there's two destroyers. And there's a Fuso right around the corner. I'm gonna have to call for help here. Shokaku's going down hard. Those destroyers really want to kill the carrier. And load HE. Oh, what strike of bad luck. Oh, I gotta get in the cap here. Ah, oh, shoot. Can I get there in time? Can I get there in time and stop the cap? Really wish those planes spot the other destroyer, which was the Musuki. We're going full speed, okay? So I'm gonna have to show the broadside to the Fuso. We gotta stop this Musuki from capping. I don't know the scout plane will help spot this Musuki, but we can get it there in time. Oh, almost. We gotta reset the cap here. If Fuso gets in the camp, I can shoot at him. Okay, I'm gonna point. Yeah, we can get there in time. Fuso. Okay, my concern is that destroyer. We have stopped the cap. Okay, Fuso's not focusing me. Oh! Now the question is how I'm gonna kill this Fubuki. Or, not Fubuki, Musuki. Okay, he's. He's right in front of me. I'm gonna be able to hit him. I'm gonna try to drop his torpedoes here. Confirmed penetration. Uh, I gotta go left hard. I might take a torpedo. If he times it right. Oh, we reset the cap. Nice. I don't see the torpedoes coming. Oh, I think he dropped them. Oh, this, that's the secondaries? Nice. Okay, I gotta continue rudder shifting because I'm pretty sure he dropped his torpedo before he died. Now Mahan wants to drop his torpedoes. Oh, look, we destroyed another destroyer. <laughs> that's nice. He dropped his torpedoes. Okay, so the tables has turned. It looks like we turned the table pretty good. Well, we don't have a carrier anymore, and they have a Lexington. Um, how are we gonna fight this? The chat is going very crazy because the carrier died. Nobody has protected flanks. Uh, well, I actually don't blame him because I played this map a couple times, and a lot of the ships can just get through without any problems. I was actually playing the Atlanta and I was able to go through the mid while getting spotted. So that tells you that really this map is wide open to get through, surprisingly. Our, our best chance of winning is really defending right now. I don't think it's gonna last long. Oh, that looking good, looking good. Three hits, 8,000 damage. Okay, we gotta kill all these other ships. If we can stay alive and kill all these ships... Oh, actually, North Carolina's not gonna live. It's not, probably not gonna live against that Cleveland. If I can kill the Atlanta, that'd be nice. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's getting a close game. 
No hits. What? Strike of bad luck again. Probably just drive by one of those black cats. Get this down before this island turns. Okay, that's not gonna hit anything. Ugh, that's terrible. Just terrible. I spotted by the. Was it Fubuki? So not Fubuki. Why is Yeah, it's Fubuki. Fubuki. Yeah. Keep thinking of something else. Okay. Oh, we can kill the Lanta. Now the Fubuki is right there. We gotta keep eyes on him. All right, Lanta is going in. Can we take him down? He's trying to kill the North Carolina. We gotta save this North Carolina here. Oh, nice! I don't know why I hit, but I hit something really important on the Atlanta. Three kills. Kabuki spotted. Oh, he's going for the torpedo run on the Imagi. Imagi, don't, don't point, don't. Okay. I'm supposed to point your stern, not your broadside here. Load. He here. Oh yeah, Amagi looks pretty dead. Can you do it? One torpedo is all that Fabuki needs. Yeah. We gotta kill him. Fabuki is the biggest target right now. We got one hit. Nice. Keep that HE going. Now, not really, you don't see Battleship chasing after destroyers, but we gotta do what we gotta do to take him out, right? Oh, good hits by somebody. I don't know who shot. Was it. Oba? Xandra is knocked out. Finish him off. Nice hits. Switching to AP. Now we gotta go for the Turpits, and then. Oh no. Torpedo bombers. Oh, he didn't win for the North Carolina, he went for the Turpits. Now, our biggest concern is uh, that Lexington. Okay, let's see where this Turpits is going. Fubuki can a little scoot over here. I need to. Train my guns. I know your guns are easy to train, but mine's not. Okay, let's kill this. Turpits. So we managed to save the cap and do some damage. Oh my gosh, that was a really close game. A lot of people don't really care about mobility, but I care about it a lot. I would trade mobility for armor. I mean, if the armor is that bad, then no, but there is always a balance, and the Turpets is a well-balanced ship, aside from her AA, which is not really that good. I mean, I haven't showed the AA action yet, but from my experience, the AA doesn't do so well against those heavily armed carriers. Now, Turpets is showing a broadside. Looks like we have got this game in the bag. Everything goes to plan. We still got a... Good health, Turpits, and I'm still in good condition also. Let's just repair. Did that kill him? Oh no, that did a lot of damage. Torpedoes got him. Nice. Is that Fubuki's torpedoes? Yeah. The full steam ahead. Okay, let's shoot down that little s scout plane. Oh, look, Lexington. He just appears. Now, Lexington is extremely fast, and believe it or not, she is the most heavily armed, not heavily armored ship for the ca the carrier category. 
and she's kind of tough to hit, even though she's a big target. She's a beautiful character, just looking at that exhaust. Why am I going this way? I forgot the rudder shift left here. It's kind of difficult to hit. Sometimes. But it looks like she's gonna die. Oh, good shot. I think that was all buzz shots. Well, that was a great game. Oh, we scored another big whopping amount of cash. 438,000 coins. 50 hits, 3 incapacitation, 3 ships were sunk, 1 set on fire, 1 citadel, and 2 for defending the flag for the team. What a savior. The Tirpitz is a hero. And we actually came top on the list. 1,900 XP for the base. Mount damage, 97,000 damage. 7,500 damage with the HE. And 277 for setting it on fire. Secondaries actually went up with 537. I think that's what killed that destroyer by surprise. Not sure. Because I didn't fire my my secondaries. Not my, not my secondary, my main armament. Or maybe my fire. Maybe the fire killed him. I don't know. Aside from that, thanks for watching, and I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I'll see you guys next time on World of Warships.